A little quote from Rudolf Steiner. How can we overcome the anxiety of our times, 1916? The unfolding of the consciousness soul will only proceed through consciously overcoming superficial sympathies and antipathies. Independence of thought should gradually penetrate all spheres of life, but it will have to oppose the blind belief in authority that is becoming more prevalent everywhere as specialists seem to gain the exclusive rights to truth. When social groups are formed, the individuals who make up these groups should be the most important thing, and not some program or list of statutes. The theoretical program, the abstraction, is the arch enemy of the present age. That's, wow. Out of the true co-working of individualities will come the true remedies for our social problems. The theoretical program is the arch enemy of the present age. We could call that um, menu consciousness. <laughs> so if it's not on the menu, don't even think about it. <laughs> if it's not on the menu, it does not exist. You can push all the buttons on your cell phone you want, but if it's not on the menu, just keep pushing those buttons. <laughs> You're not going to get the will. present age. Yeah, that's really powerful, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so there's an issue here. And it's the issue, it's the difference between innovation and the activity of the I being. In today's world, innovation is valued above all things. Innovation is the clever manipulation of things that are already known <laughs> <laughs> through, per, through permutation and reversal and taking little bits of algorithms and blowing them up into other algorithms and keep repeating backwards and forwards what was developed until you end up with, you know, box art of the fugue or something. It's just forward and backward. But Bach was a Pythagorean. <coughs> Bach was making sacred architecture with his music. He wasn't selling the owner. There's a difference in the intent. Bach was incarnating the divine through alchemical permutation. <coughs> And we are trying to say there is no divine, there is only repetition in innovative ways. So the, the repetition of things forwards, backwards, upside down has become abstract. It's no longer a living, a living force. There's a funny story about Bach and the art of the fugue. He was a member of the Pythagorean Society. And uh, during his age, his day, as he was an old man, his uh, music was considered kind of passe because it was just totally about fugues. And you know, that's like the 1400s, we're already way past that. So his music at the end of his life was considered to be very kind of old. So his son worked for a duke. And the Duke was a very gifted pianist, harpsichordist and pianist. <clears throat> and um, uh, Bach's son worked for that court. So Bach's son invited the elder Bach, Johann Sebastian, 
to the court at, under the um, request of the Duke to come. And what Bach would do would be go into the court and people would uh, call out or write down a theme, a short theme, and he'd sit at the piano and make a fugue out of the theme because he was just living in the living geometry of this. So the Duke uh, felt that he was a little tired of that. Okay, here's the French mode, here's the German mode, here's the mode, here's, you know, whatever, the Italian mode. He said, we're going to make, I'm going to make a theme that it will be impossible to make a few we're going to invite your father to the court. We're going to have a little fun. <laughs> so the elder Bob came. They handed him the script of the couple bars there, the beginning. That that if you know the art of the fugue, it's da 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 da. There were all these minors and all kinds of stuff happening in there, and. <clears throat> He sat down and tried to play it, and it was just unwieldy and ungainly. And they were all like, yeah, I've got this old guy, I finally got it. And he said, I'll be back. <laughs> and he left. A year later, he came back with some contributions towards you know, the art of harmony. And it's this 14 fugues to die for, the, the height <laughs> of the art with unraveling the mysteries of that theme, forwards, backwards, and it goes, uh, it's just like looking at a ge geometric drawing. One, two, three, four, five. And you look at the spacing and the music and the pictures, you could draw diagrams of it, you'd end up with squares and triangles and all kinds of things. Brilliant, brilliant thing. Yeah. So this inner, Creativity to overcome this is not innovation. The innovation is not finding new permutations. It's just re reassessing what is old. In order to be creative, we have to understand that when I innovate, I'm enchanting and deepening the enchantment in the beings that are the forces of the natural world. I'm just locking them more and more into repetitious patterns. That's what we value today as innovation. But I have, as a human, I have a capacity in my imagination to transcend innovation. <coughs> transcendent capacity. And the ancient people recognized that transcendent capacity in the human. They also recognized innovation. But they said there's a higher wisdom in the human that is slumbering. And we have to have special faculties and trainings to bring that out. And those special faculties and trainings are known as mystery school wisdom or initiation. So Rudolf Steiner is a mystery school teacher who has come back to teach us how to disenchant the elemental beings who are being locked in this other kind of will. And because that will comes from the spirit. It needs spiritual beings to, as Rudolf Steiner put it, give nature back to the God. This is the biodynamics, Waldorf education, the medical work, nutrition, <laughs> the arts. All the things that Rudolf Steiner uh, pioneered to bring are vehicles for training the imagination to create forces in the will that can um, enculturate, that can create new society. We need, we need a 
imaginative forces to solve social problems, not analytical ones. The analytical ones are the reason why we got in the problem in the first place. It's because all your intellect can do is give you menu choices. We never solve a problem, especially a social problem, intellectually. We solve it with our heart. And the heart thinks in pictures that move in lawful ways. The heart, the heart thoughts are imaginative. So good nutrition, working in the arts, working again in nature with a background of planetary movements, all of these things are mystery traditions that Rolf Steiner had the genius to bring together, present to us a new kind of schooling. The schooling of the heart to learn how to think in living pictures because the age demands it. This is the social will of the age demands that people learn how to control their inner pictures. <laughs> and I didn't want to depress you, but I wanted to give you a picture of really the implications of this. Tomorrow we'll look at the work of Christian Rosenkreutz and the um, entering into dream life, the transformation of dream life, continuity of consciousness, building the hut, all the things that Rudolf Steiner talks about in Knowledge of the Higher World, as meditative practices to develop the capacity to think pictorially. This is, this is the great golden thread in the Waldorf educational movement, is that the teachers have to learn to do it so that the children aren't prevented from doing it. Children know how to do it, it just gets knocked out of them by the savage technocratic demands of our present age. <laughs> so, the, so this work that Rudolf Steiner brought in imaginative cognition is the key to social will. So I'd like to finish with a little quote here from Leading Thoughts, page 156. In a waking state, human being lives in the thought shadows cast by a dead and dying world. And in the will, the human can no more penetrate than into the processes of deep, dreamless sleep, where unconscious impulses of will flow into the shadows of thought the free dominion of self-consciousness arises. Man, in his waking state, does not perceive the cosmic life that is germinating in the earth. Above him is the extra-earthly cosmos. Beneath him, in the earthly realm, a world whose true essence of cosmic life is hidden from him. <clears throat> but in between, when awake, the free eye manifests itself, its essence radiating out in full light of knowledge and free volition. It is different in the sleeping state. In sleep, man lives in his astral body, <clears throat> an eye embedded in the germinating life of the earth. His dreams, too, are permeated by germinating life. Gazing half-consciously upon his dreams, man witnesses the creative forces whereby he himself is woven out of the cosmos. In this lighting up of dreams, human thought is still alive. It is only after man awakens that thought is gathered up into the forces whereby it dies and becomes a shadow. This connection between our dream conceptions and our waking thoughts is of the greatest significance. 
Man thinks by utilizing the very forces whereby he grows and lives. Yet he cannot become a thinker until these living forces die. In his thoughts, he possesses a dead picture of that which, working from the fully living reality of the etheric world, builds and creates him. When this distinction of life is overcome through imaginative consciousness, there stands before the human soul not a sharply outlined physical earth composed of minerals and plants and the animal kingdom of nature, but webs of vital processes kindled to life within earth and flaming forth into the macro. 